A Dark Fantastic Network Presentation Last Scene A Mystery Cooper called William. Lara had come home. She was safe. For now, that would have to do. But later today, William would have to talk to her and find out what she knew. Now, there was someone he had to meet. William got off the bus. From here, he'd have to walk. Fifteen minutes later, William reached the gate of the old house. He looked up. Only a couple of hours of daylight left. He pushed open the little wooden gate and started towards the house, a small, neat Georgian house well taken care of. And the closer he got to the house, the more it all came back to him. The memories, the books, the music. He reached the door. And suddenly he felt nervous. Not bad, nervous, but the kind of nervous that kids felt when they went to see a grown-up they admired. He took a deep breath and rang the doorbell. A moment later, Mr. Goff opened the door. When he saw William, a gentle smile appeared on his aged, aristocratic face. And, in his soothing English accent, he said, Billy, dear boy, it's so good to see you. William smiled back and went inside. In the study, a small room with the feel of a nook in an old library. William and Mr. Goff were seated at a small table covered with a few black and white photos, hardcover reference volumes, and dozens of printed documents. Mr. Goff touched one of these papers with the tip of a finger, then said, This is where she was last seen, Michelle, I mean? William nodded. Yes. And it is the same place that her sister, Lara, said she felt some sort of vibration, a hum that seemed to call to her, in a manner of speaking, Mr. Goff said. Yes, William said. I remember Lara Vincent and her younger sister, Michelle. Lara was in my class. Very smart girl, very composed. I don't think she's one for fancies and such. If she believes, then it's probably true. William nodded, ashamed that he'd ever doubted Lara, that deep inside, a small part of him still doubted her. And then there are the other reports, Mr. Goff said, pointing to a spot on a small map placed before him on the table. That spot in Wallace Street is one of many where similar reports have been made, all by people claiming to have heard something a sort of low-frequency sound that only they could hear. The reports are few and far between, but over the past year, they've piled up, so much so that they captured my attention. William nodded. He didn't find it strange that Mr. Goff, his old English teacher, would be following such esoteric subjects. He'd always been a kind, deeply knowledgeable man with a childlike fascination for mysteries. A warm eccentric whose love of the unexplained always fascinated William, who, as a child, tended to lose himself in such tales when Mr. Goff told them in his own entrancing manner. In a way, for William, Mr. Goff embodied that old-fashioned brand of storytelling that was steeped in tradition, romance, and old-school charm, and which also made up much of why William loved radio and old-time shows. Come to think of it, the first time he'd heard one of those old mystery shows, a cracking episode of The Shadow was in Mr. Goff's office back in high school on a small, transistor radio that Mr. Goff always carried with him in his beat-up Gladstone bag. Now, sitting this close to him again, William could smell the older man's cologne, a faint, pleasing scent, and that musty, spicy aroma of aging books that seemed to always cling to him. Both smells brought warm, pleasant memories to the fore, of a time gone by and a childhood missed. Are you with me, Billy? Yeah. Sorry, William said. Good. It's hard to pinpoint the exact location of where that hum is coming from. The reports come from all over the place. But all these accounts of spots where that hum was heard have two things in common. One, they all came from people who just had someone close to them go missing. Two, they all reported that soon after they started hearing that sound, they saw someone following them from afar. A stranger. A stranger in black, William said, completing Mr. Goff's sentence. Mr. Goff looked up from the papers on the table. Exactly. A stranger in black, he said. You've seen him. William nodded again. I have. Describe him. William did, to the best of his ability, trying to piece together a coherent image of a figure he only remembered in quick, darkly impressions. I see, Mr. Goff said. 
He moved away from the table, leaned against a window seat. Outside, night was approaching. He put his hands in the pockets of his light brown wool sweater, the thumbs sticking out, rubbing the fabric. Those eyes, those eyes you describe, coupled with other reports by people who saw him, make me think of a name. A dark figure from long ago who used to haunt different parts of the world. But most reports, especially more recent ones, come from Europe. Mr. Goff pushed himself away from the window seat, came to the table again. I already had my suspicions. So I printed this out, he said, picking up a paper and handing it to William. They called him spring -Heel Jack. spring -Heel Jack became a sensation in Victorian England around the mid-19th century. He was seen mostly after sundown on foggy nights. First, people heard the footsteps of someone at their heels unseen. Then they heard the laughter echoing all around them. Then they saw his eyes glowing in the fog. His appearance always signified a coming event, a violent change. Some think he is the catalyst, others believe he's just a harbinger, a mischievous messenger who exploits the fear. What is he? William said. No one knows. Some scholars think he's a figment of overwrought Victorian fancies. Others think he goes back much further, that his legend is much older, going back centuries. What all the records agree upon is this. He's not human, and he's not of this world. And he's evil, William said. Well, he's not a force for the good, but there is no record of him actually harming anyone, physically that is. He seems to be more of a manipulator of minds and souls. A devil, William said, remembering the stranger's eyes, the fear he struck in William's heart. Maybe. The legends say that he is mischievous, that he is a harbinger of an ill wind and that he relishes the chaos that ensues with his arrival. If he doesn't use violence, then how has he taken Michelle? I think he lures his victims by seduction. The glitter of dark promises, Mr. Goff said. What could he offer her that would make her leave everything and everyone she knew behind? William said. Her heart's desire, Mr. Goff said. William shook his head, taking all of this in. And what's he doing here in my city? William said. That? I know. Mr. Goff said. And behind him, William could see that night had fallen and he could hear the sound of distant thunder. spring -Heel Jack is looking for something and I hope to God he doesn't find it. What is he looking for? It's connected to that sound people are hearing. That hum. He's looking for something underneath the city, William said. Mr. Goff nodded, said, some kind of machine. William pushed himself back slowly, away from the table, got up and started to pace, as he thought of Lara and what she had told him, about the machine, about it being alive. You already know this, don't you, Billy? Mr. Goff said. Lara told me, but I didn't believe her. Do you believe her now? Mr. Goff said. I don't know what to believe. All right, but know this, dear boy. This Jack doesn't care if you believe or not, doesn't care if you win or lose. All he cares about is your fear and your pain, and he thrives on both. Is this why he took Michelle? To cause Lara pain? That's part of the reason, I surmise, why he took Michelle and others like her, and yes, there are many others, but very few have connected the dots yet. But I think his main purpose is using them to find the machine. William stopped, shook his head. This was getting too much for him. What are you talking about? Mr. Goff smiled a patient smile, the kind he used to give William in class when William asked an obvious question. The first time I noticed you, Billy, you were in third grade, I think. One of your teachers was looking for you. I happened to overhear that they couldn't seem to be able to find you, and so, when I saw you in the school library, tucked away in a corner, almost hiding, a book in your hands, so absorbed in what you were reading, I somehow knew you were special. A boy in touch with his imagination. Especially after I came closer and saw what you were reading. Do you remember which book you had in your hands? William wanted to say no, he didn't remember, because, for some reason, the memory hurt. It wasn't a bad memory, but it reminded him of a time when he was truly happy, of something he could never have again. I see you do remember. You were reading the Ladybird edition of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's The Hound of the Baskervilles, the one with that magnificently lurid cover. The large hound with the glowing eyes, Mr. Goff said, and smiled a terrific smile. William couldn't help smiling back. You were a lonely boy and you weren't happy at home. 
But like all sensitive people with an appetite for life, the ones who have true strength deep within them, you found your way out. And that way out was your mind, your imagination. Remember that strength and remember who you always wanted to be. If you do that, I think you can find your way through this darkness, find your way to the girl. He reached out and laid his hand over William's, and for the first time, William saw how old that hand looked and realized how much time had passed since he'd seen Mr. Goff, a friend. If ever there was one. Mr. Goff slowly pulled his hand away, placed it on the table. He took a moment to gather his thoughts, then he said, I think that creature, that stranger, went after Michelle to get to Laura. Why? Because she hears the call of that machine spring heel Jack is looking for. Maybe he wanted to lure Lara out of her safe world into the open so he could follow her straight to the source, the source he can't seem to find on his own. Mr. Goff said, Are you saying Michelle was bait? Yes. But Lara started hearing that sound after Michelle went missing, William said. Somehow, he seems to know who is susceptible to its call even before they themselves know it. That's why he's taken so many. They unknowingly follow the trail, doing his dirty work for him. But I think he hasn't long to wait. He has almost found it. And when he does find it, what then? What will he do to Michelle, to Lara? Mr. Goff shook his head, letting out his breath. We need to find a way to stop him before he achieves his goal. How long have you known about all this? William said. Mr. Goff slowly got up, went to an old cabinet, opened a drawer and took out a photo, looking at it longingly. He turned around and handed the photo to William. My granddaughter. Her name is Maddie. She is missing too. This has been Last Scene A Mystery <laughs>